Hey guys, uh, today we are going to be reacting to Shyler Baylor, who is a trans athlete, a swimmer. Um, he, his accolades include LGBTQ Nation's Instagram Advocate of the Year, a Glad Media Award nomination, the Out 100, and the prestigious Harvard Athletics Director's Award, which is not granted annually, but only when an athlete demonstrates outstanding contribution to athletics through education. So he's an educator, he's an advocate, he's been fighting for the inclusion of trans women in the female sports category, he's an international speaker, so he must know what he's talking about. So let, let's listen to what he has to say. An argument against trans athletes in sports. Fully grown men have advantages over women in sports. So let's talk about it. First and foremost, trans women are not men. Trans women are women. Second, That's completely irrelevant. Uh, the important question is they are male. So <laughs> whether they're women or not is completely irrelevant because the important question is, are they male and did they go through male puberty? Again, this discussion of a fully grown man is intended to be transphobic and intended to fear monger. If you are afraid of quote, fully grown men invading women's sports, who are you afraid of? That's right, you're afraid of men. Uh, no, not afraid of men, afraid of males who have gone through male puberty competing in the female sports division. Cis men, not trans women. Cis men and trans women are both male and in most cases, <laughs> both gone through male puberty and thus retain the same physiological advantage that being male and going through male puberty confers. And no, I'm not erasing biology or ignoring the science. I understand what this person meant to say, which is that those who are assigned male. Uh, it's not about being assigned male at birth. You're either are male or you're not male and trans women are male. <laughs> at birth, for example, cis men and trans women have some sort of biological difference that then some sort of biological difference. So oh, they just have some sort of difference. What could that be? Like, it's not like that's been like endlessly studied by every single medical and sports establishment and decisively proven over and over that forms the logical basis for the differentiation between male sports and female sports and could pose an advantage in sports. They could pose just just hypothetically. They just could, you know. It's just that they, they just could pose, but you know, it's not like there's any prior logical basis or empirical evidence to suppose that males have an advantage for females in sports. That's just crazy. Is this true? The short answer is yes, but also no. Uh, answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes. Research does show that on average, and on average is very important, on average, performance does differ between the men's category and the women's category. And some people might call this sex different. Okay. Um, he's saying on average, um, you know, on average, you know, males are just, you know, on average, a little bit better than females, but, you know, not, not that big of a difference. So let's actually look at... Uh, one statistic here that's interesting. Um, I'm citing from this paper called The Biological Basis of Sex Differences in Athletic Performance, Consistent, consensus statement from the American College of Sports Medicine. So they start off the introduction with this very interesting fact. They say, uh, for example, the advantages of men over women in athletic performance that require muscle power and endurance are illustrated in the comparison of the best times of men men 400 meter runners and the top three women running times in 2019 where motivation does not differ between sexes over 10,000 men including boys um, younger than 18 years old ran faster than the three fastest recorded women in that year 2019 <laughs> illustrating no overlap in the performance of men and women at the top level so it's not just about like averages here like men dominate they categorically dominate <laughs> like um 10, men including boys younger than 18 years old ran faster than the three fastest recorded women i mean that is just like it's like night and day um and there and it's just like oh like there could be a difference there might be a difference oh maybe there's a difference um so <laughs> performance but the reality is that sex as a category is a bit muddy most people think no it's not muddy you're either male or you're female and that's it <laughs> and like in, 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 intersex dsc dsd that does not muddy the waters those are edge cases but they they do not negate the fact that there's only two sexes because there are two gametes uh, there's sperm and eggs those form the basis the philosophical and scientific rational basis for 
the differentiation between males and females. You either go down the sperm pathway or you go down the male pathway. Th those are the two options. Humans go down the male path pathway or the female pathway, sperm or egg pathway. That's it. Those are the options. And it's not muddy. It's not vague. It's not ambiguous. Those are the options. Those are what, that's what the science says. Um, I think that biological sex is binary, but the reality is it is bimodal. It is a spectrum. And therefore, it is not a spectrum. <laughs> you either go down the sperm pathway or the egg pathway. And there can be um, problems that arise when you go down those different pathways. And there are only two pathways, but there can be problems that arise as part of the development. And that's what leads to disorders of uh, sexual development. But just the fact that there's disorders of sexual development going down one of the two pathways, does that mean that there's like some infinite spectrum or continuum between the two pathways? <laughs> like there are discrete states. So it's not a spectrum. There's just two pathways. If we're trying to categorize bodies by sex is fallible. That uh, it's not really fallible. It's pretty darn reliable, <laughs> which is why we... Uh, distinguish between males and females in sports, and it's why uh, 10,000 men ran faster than the three fastest women. That seems pretty clear-cut to me. I don't see a continuum there at all. That said, even if we did use sex-differentiated performance as a metric, sex differentiation is largely mitigated by testosterone released during and after puberty for those assigned male at birth who haven't undergone any medical interventions, which is why all elite-level sports that allow trans women in the women's category require those trans women to undergo testosterone suppression. And it's not for like one or two days. You can't take the suppressants and then compete the next day. You have to be on the suppressants for one to three years. Available evidence shows that trans women who've undergone this testosterone suppression hold no significant biological advantages over cis women. But let's go back to how I said. Okay, so that's kind of where his science piece uh, ends. So I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about his claim that, let's see, what is the claim? Um, days. You can't take the suppressants and then compete the next day. You have to be on the suppressants for one to three years. Available evidence shows that trans women who've undergone this testosterone suppression hold no significant bi- Okay, the claim is that trans women who have undergone this testosterone suppression for one to three years, um, hold no significant biological advantage over cis women. And he says, this is what the evidence shows. Let, let's actually look at the evidence. I think this would be um, very, very telling. Um, so I'm going to switch switch gears here. Um, all right, give me a second. Um, okay, so... Let's look at this review of the literature, Transgender Women in the Female Category of Sports, Perspectives on Testosterone Suppression and Performance Advantage. Um, uh, we report that the performance gap between males and females becomes significant at puberty and often amounts to 10 to 50%, depending on the sport. Um, longitudinal studies examining the effects of testosterone suppression on muscle mass and strength in transgender women consistently show very modest changes where the loss of lean body mass, muscle area, and strength typically amounts to approximately 5% after 12 months of treatment. Thus, the muscular advantage enjoyed by transgender women is only minimally reduced when testosterone is suppressed. Um, okay, so that's one review of evidence. How about another review of evidence? How does hormone transition in transgender women change body composition, muscle strength, and hemoglobin? Systematic review. Um, reviewing uh, 24 studies were identified and reviewed. Um, in conclusion, um, these findings suggest that strength may well be preserved in trans women during the first three years of hormone therapy. Um, okay, so that seems seems pretty significant to me. Here, here's another review of the literature. Um, this descriptive critical review discusses the inherent male physiological advantages that lead to superior athletic performance and then addresses how estrogen therapy fails to create a female-like physiology in the male. Ultimately, the former male physiology of trans women athletes provides them with a physiological advantage over the cis female athlete. Okay, that's interesting. Um, how about this study? Um, this study is mu 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 muscle strength, size, and composition following 12 months of gender-affirming treatment in transgender individuals retained advantage for trans women. Let's see what this says. They compared um, trans men who went on testosterone versus trans women who went on uh, testosterone suppression. Conclusion. Cross-sex hormone treatment markedly affects muscle strength, size, and composition in transgender individuals. Despite the robust increases in muscle mass and strength in trans men, and the trans women were still stronger and had more muscle mass following 12 months of treatment. 
So these are females who got, you know, took testosterone, basically steroids, for 12 months and then compared them to trans women, uh, males, who reduced their testosterone for 12 months, and the trans women were still stronger at the end of that process. Here's another study uh, talking about the grip strength and the impact of hormone suppression or uh, of, ho of hormone therapy on grip strength. After 12 months, the median grip strength of trans women still falls into the 95th percentile for age-matched females. Um, and even if the hormone uh, therapy reduced muscle size in trans women, um, there is this question about uh, whether or not, um, or yeah, it's this question, do equal, do equal sized muscles express the same levels of strength between sexes? So even if the hormone therapy reduced the size of the muscles to be a comparable size to females, which it doesn't, but let's say it did hypothetically, would that same muscle size be just as strong? Um, so overall, 76% uh, to 88% of the strength assessed assessments were greater in males than females with pair matched muscle thickness, regardless of contraction types. Um, additionally, males in the lightest weight division in the International Powerlifting Federation largely outperform females in the heavier weight division. So that, that is also interesting. Um, so yeah, it seems like um, there is a, a quite a lot of advantages of, over um, cis women. But let's go back. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it, so it seems like there actually are like a lot of um, biological advantages that are retained even after 12, one to three years of hormone suppression. Um, so uh, Shiler's statement is completely false and not supported by the evidence whatsoever. So let's let's keep listening. To how I said on average is really important when we're talking about this topic. Biological differences and therefore biological advantages and disadvantages exist within every category within every demographic. But when those differences exist in the men's category, say with Michael Phelps or LeBron James or Shaquille O'Neal, people say, wow, that's amazing, a genetic freak, a freak of nature, an anomaly, incredible. They love it, they praise it. But when those differences exist in the women's category, it's suddenly unfair. Especially okay, so let's let's just do a thought experiment because I'm a philosopher, I, I like thought experiments. Thought experiments help us test the limits of our ideas. So yes, Michael Phelps, genetic freak, crazy long arm span, webbed feet, super tall, very muscular, very broad shoulders, you know, and you know, it does not seem conceivable to me that if Michael Phelps was female in some alternative world that he would have developed all those features because even though he is a genetic freak, he also has those features uh, because he went through male puberty. If he hadn't gone through male puberty, he likely would not have developed into the super freak he was. So him being male seems to be at least somewhat relevant to the fact that he is a, a very, very good athlete, you know, at least compared to all the females. Um, so now well, let's imagine that Michael, Michael Phelps was in his prime and he suddenly came out as transgender. He said, I have been dealing with gender dysphoria my entire life. I've known since I was a little child, five years old, that I was a girl, that I, you know, I, I, I am a woman, that I want to be a girl. And I, I've just been suppressing it my whole life. And, you know, but deep down, I have a gender identity of a woman. So now let's say Michael Phelps decides to go on hormone therapy for one to three years. And, um, now, in this thought experiment, remember, this is a thought experiment, he, he would be equally entitled under Shiler Baylor's trans inclusion policy to compete in the female category. Because it's like, how is it any different from Leah Thomas? Leah Thomas, also born male, also went through male puberty, but has an identity of a woman. And it's that identity of a woman plus the combination of going on a uh, hormone therapy that provides the logical justification for Leah Thomas to compete in the female sports category. Now, in this thought experiment, Michael Phelps has an equal um, valid uh, opportunity to um, compete in the female league because in, in, in this example, Michael Phelps is a you know totally valid trans woman, has a gender identity, has the identity of 
of a woman has a, di a medical diagnosis of, of gender dysphoria, you know, wants to be his true self or like her, her true self. And in this, you know, example, Michael Phelps goes on hormone therapy. Now, um, is it going to be fair for Michael Phelps to compete in the female category and to say like, oh, like that, that that's just a thought experiment. That That's not reality. Like no, no real trans woman would ever like that could never happen. Well, why not? Why not? Like, why not LeBron James? Why not Shaquille O'Neal? Why not Michael Phelps? Why couldn't they be trans? There's nothing about trans theory or gender theory that says that, you know, super successful elite male athletes can't go on to develop, can't, can't identify as trans women. Like there, there's nothing that you can predict about anyone that can tell whether or not they might possibly be a secretly trans woman. Maybe Michael Phelps has been struggling with gender dysphoria his whole life and he just never, he's still in the closet. Like that is theoretically metaphysically possible. And in this thought experiment, like under Shiloh Baylor's, you know, proposed rules, it would be totally fair for Michael Phelps to compete in the female division so long as he went on hormone therapy for one to three, three years. Does that make any sense? Is that logical? <laughs> no, that is not logical. And the thought experiment proves the logical limits of this idea. And it just so happens coincidentally that all the males who have been competing in the female category are not starting off as elite male athletes, but it's not impossible. We might see that. Like, what What if LeBron James came out as trans, like, you know, tomorrow and started on hormones? Would, would that be fair? Why Why not? You say, like, oh, well, that, that's not fair, but, you know, why? Like, like it, it's not impossible that Michael Phelps could be a secret trans woman because we, we see – trans women coming out at age 30, age 40, all, 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 all the time. And no one knew because they've been hiding it their whole lives. They've been repressing it. And, and there's, you can't tell from the outside and there's no like correlate of gender identity. You know, it's just, it, it, it's a subjective feeling. You just come out and say, Hey, I have this subjective feeling. I'm trans. I I'm, I'm a woman on the inside. And <laughs> like, so in the sound experiment, under Shiler Baylor's proposed inclusion, we would just celebrate. Oh, Michael Phelps, you're a genetic freak. You're like, you know, crazy tall and super long arm string. You're just like, you know, a, ver a variant of a female. You're, you're just a super special woman who, who like, um, you know, just happens to be, you know, different and we should celebrate that and it would be totally fair to compete in the female division no that doesn't make sense that's not logical and the thought experiment proves that it's not logical and like it, it shows that this way of thinking like does not meet up with reality um so let's keep listening especially if the woman holding the differences is black or trans indigenous any other kind of marginalized this is not actually about fairness it's about misogyny anti-blackness and transphobia no it's not about those things it's not about transphobia i, ha I hate this th this argument that oh if you disagree on this topic you're a transphobe you're a bigot no that is not true that is false you can respect the gender identity of a trans woman and still think that it is not fair for males, no matter how much hormone therapy they've gone on to compete in the female category, because we don't divide sports based on your gender identity. We base it based on your body. Sports are about bodies, not identities. <laughs> and like, this is based on science. It's based on empiricism. It's based on logic. Empiricism, logic, and rationality are not transphobic. Facts cannot be transphobic. Science cannot be transphobic. This idea that you must be a bigot if you disagree with this issue is so toxic. And that's why I keep talking about this, because there's this narrative from trans activists that if you did disagree with on this, you're you're just a misogynist. You hate women. You you hate, you know, indigenous people. You, you know, you you hate trans people. No, I, I don't hate trans people. I just think that they're deluded very often about science. <laughs> like it's about, I care about the facts. I care about the truth. It is okay to care about truth and facts. 
and you cannot predict someone's ideological position. You, you cannot predict someone's politics from the mere fact that they believe trans women are male and that males have a physiological advantage. Like that is just a fact. Like facts do not correlate with political ideology. They, it's not a hateful thing. It's not hateful to say that one plus one equals two. It is not hateful to say that the sky is blue. It is not hateful to say that males are different than females. It's just statements of fact. So yeah, this, this is crazy to me, but, um, all right, that's it. Thanks for watching.